free waters, but is it too late to gain public trust? And if the government can't get this right, how's it going to push through other reforms like health and co-governance? I spoke to local government minister Nanaya Mahuta and asked her why, after five years of development, the public still can't understand it. That is correct. We've taken five years to work on policy to raise the issues uh, amongst local government and with stakeholders about the nature and scale of the challenge. Uh, but we still have to do a lot to ensure that the public are fully aware of the reasons why reform is taking place. So do you admit, I suppose, that the communication around this policy so far hasn't been perfect in terms of the public? in terms of council and iwi? Well, this hasn't happened. Yeah, look, the, the communication around uh, the state of health of the infrastructure network is not just a today or even yesterday or even the last five years challenge. It's been a challenge over the last two decades of underinvestment uh, in the water's infrastructure system. So we are going to have to continue uh, to educate the public around the scale of the challenge and the need for reform. But I can say that every council recognises that the status quo is not acceptable and change is required. Do you think, Minister, that you've um, been able to take those councils with you on this issue? It doesn't feel like it from uh, where I'm sitting. Look, I, I, it would be true to say that the nature of the changes that we're proposing and they are system-wide are complex and challenging. And change is always resisted uh, uh, because of the sheer uh, scale of um, uh, the sheer scale of the challenge that we're trying to meet. And sitting across think... all of that reform challenge is actually trying to educate the public and also councils along the way. But this is crucial work. We, I think we all agree on that and that the ultimate goal is one that um, everybody agrees with. But it is just so difficult for people to understand, Minister. Uh, it is difficult and complex, but it's, uh, we have taken steps to try and ensure uh, that the challenges are not conflated in ways that are unhelpful to the need to drive reform, drive change for better uh, outputs or outcomes for communities and especially ratepayers uh, to maintain uh, affordability as a key consideration to ensure that we have a public model of delivering services and we safeguard against privatisation. You know, driving controversial and complex change like this requires trust and it feels like you have lost the trust uh, of the councils and of the public on the way through this process and that is important, isn't it? I think that's an overstatement. What I've done is tried to ensure all the way through, as difficult and complex as these set of issues are, we've worked uh, with the sector, and it's been challenging uh, because of the complexity of the issues. The fact that councils themselves didn't have a full set of information, and it wasn't until we went through a process to get uh, greater disclosure of information to assess the scale of the challenge that for the first time councils were able to see across the system and they recognised that actually this is a huge challenge and the status quo just isn't good enough. Well, the councils, uh, some of the councils at least, I think would probably disagree with that statement because they, that we've heard from them directly that they say, said that government hasn't been listening, that they have lost trust in this process. Yes, there are a few councils who remain uh, resistant to change, but that's not for want of trying on central government's part. And in fact, establishing the working group to look at governance, representation and local voice was a direct response to those councils who identified at the, at the strategic level those were the areas of concern that they had most um, elevated uh, for government to respond to, and we're doing that. And well, getting it right in, in this uh, with Three Waters is really important, though, isn't it, Minister? Because, uh, you, as you've said, that these are complex changes and, and we, you haven't necessarily managed to take everybody with you on this. But you are also looking to centralise uh, health, for example. You are opening up the process around co-governance. So what have you learned from Three Waters that you may be able to do better in those two reforms? Oh, look, I'll just stay to the area that I'm responsible for in terms of poly policy design. Uh, and it's really important not to conflate the, the issues of co-governance in ways that aren't relevant. For example, in relation to Three Waters, at the regional uh, representative uh, governance level, there are ways in which... Uh, 
iwi and councils can work together for the broader benefits of the community. That's been well endorsed by the Governance Working Group. Uh, the government has picked up those recommendations to strengthen that governance oversight role and how uh, those interests can work together, not to be combative, but actually to embark on a, a road of shared decision making for community benefit. And I think that's got to be positive as we move forward uh, in this area. Uh, Minister, this is not a done deal yet, is it? Because uh, National have said that it's going to repeal this policy. Uh, we have an election next year. Why not go try and get cross-party support much earlier in this process? If all of the parties agree on the problem, why not get that cross-party support much earlier and uh, get a secure outcome for New Zealanders? Well, let's go right to the politics of it. In the nine years that National was in government, these issues were around and, and prevalent. Uh, but they had a number of local government ministers rolling through the portfolio, not really looking to do, uh, promote any type of change. Now that we're government and we've taken a serious issue forward in a way that they are very complex challenges and we want to make progress, uh, we're up for a cross-parliamentary uh, agreement on safeguarding against privatisation. I've sent a letter to every uh, party in Parliament to say at the core of these changes we want to ensure a public uh, system of water service provision and safeguard against privatisation and that is the way that we could get cross-parliamentary agreement on the way forward. Now, have if you, those Minister, political you parties don't want them? to do have that, that's clear for... evidence. They're probably not prepared to do anything. Have you sat down with the Minister? Have you asked them for cross-party uh, support? Because we're pretty late in the process now. I've certainly sent a letter to those parties asking for support to safeguard against the privatisation uh, of water assets in the public interest, and I'm still waiting for a response. Mm, OK. Um, I want to talk, switch now um, to your foreign affairs hat, Minister. Uh, and it, things are heating up in the Pacific, aren't they? We have uh, the Solomon signing a security pact with China. Um, have, what do you think about that? What's your position on that? Yeah, New Zealand has uh, raised its concern around the nature of those agreements. Uh, and uh, while there's no uh, full visibility on, on what those agree agreements entail, we've said that you know, regional security interests are a matter for the region to discuss. Uh, we are concerned that there is the potential of militarisation of the Pacific through perhaps sighting of a base uh, in Honiara. Uh, the Prime Minister has since uh, said that that is not the case and they'll have to be held to account uh, with all of the Pacific around uh, that type of undertaking. But it is important uh, that the Pacific look to each other first uh, in terms of support for security agreements. Well, that's right. And Australia has a security pact with the Solomon Islands. And we don't seem to be disappointed or have a problem with that. Is this about a mistrust, I suppose, of China in the region? Actually, the Big Tower Declaration puts an obligation on the Pacific to be a first port of call for response on security-related uh, issues, and New Zealand is a part of that response. We only need to look to the Solomon Islands and the way in which uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, Fiji, New Zealand and Australia responded to the most recent unrest uh, to be able to demonstrate that we are there for each other, we support each other, and it's important that we look within the Pacific before looking outside of the Pacific for the nature of those types of agreements. Minister, is this about a, a lack of trust, I suppose, of, uh, of China and of being a good actor in the region? This is about reaffirming that Pacific security arrangements should look to the Pacific partners first and foremost. And again, we've said uh, that the right place for this discussion, because at a strategic level it is a discussion that primarily affects the Pacific, uh, that that should take place within the Pacific Island Forum. And we're encouraging all Pacific leaders, as well as the Secretariat, led by Fiji and the Secretary-General, to uh, lead those discussions at the next meeting. Have you had direct uh, discussions with the Solomons since that signing? Not as yet, not as yet. You would expect that though? Yes, and uh, I would also expect that there'd be greater visibility over the nature of the agreements. And I think that's why the Pacific Island Forum is the right place to discuss these issues. Minister, thanks so much for joining us here on The Nation. Thank you. If you've got a new 